a mere daily survival in ordinary life? And I think that's the main question. And we have to find a solution all together to that problem of fundamental rights and freedoms and social security, I would say. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Professor Roma. Uh, next will speak Misha Djurkovic from the European Institute from Serbia from Belgrade. Uh, dear friends and colleagues, uh, 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 dear Tomlačini, Legodara, za poziv. First of all, uh, I have to excuse myself uh, that actually I'm very sorry that due to objective circumstances I was forced not to be with you in the last two days. Uh, so at least, uh, sorry, I had a uh, uh, chance to be with you today and I'm really happy to be in Skopje. Sorry, just, okay. Well, and uh, I hope that we will have a, a, some other time uh, to really speak much more and to uh, be around uh, uh, because I'm really very much interested about what is going on in this country. Uh, uh, today, uh, my presentation is, as you see, called uh, at the panel dealing with the uh, as we said, uh, new rising powers coming to the uh, Europe, uh, dealing mostly with Turkey and China. I uh, will be focused on Turkey, which is for us here at the Balkans becoming more and more important player. And uh, uh, first, before I start the presentation, I would like briefly to introduce you to the project we had at the Institute uh, two years ago. Uh, this was the conference, uh, and after that we published this collection of works. It's called the uh, Tulska Regional Silva question mark, Turkish regional power with question mark, uh, trying to, in three different uh, levels, analyze what's going on in Turkey at the first level, dealing with the position of uh, economics, uh, uh, cultural policy, uh, uh, military, uh, then uh, one special case, uh, the position of Jemaats, which are becoming more and more important uh, uh, factors in Turkey. The second part is dealing with international politics or with the foreign policy of Turkey in relations with Russia, with USA, uh, uh, Germany, uh, uh, Caspian, uh, 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 part of the world, uh, Near East and so on. And the third part is especially dealing with the Balkans, Turkey and the Balkans, uh, focusing of course on the last uh, uh, five or six years. So, uh, I brought one copy here, it will be uh, Gidas. Uh, it is uh, publicly available at the internet, or the, at the uh, uh, website of the Institute, whoever wants, uh, and I, as far as I know, majority of the people can read uh, Serbian and Cyrillic, so uh, please uh, uh, just go on. Uh, we would be very happy to see your comments. So, going back to the, uh, our presentation, as you see, I call this uh, Turkey and the EU and the Balkans summary in between. So, the presentation will be just focused on the, well, brief uh, introduction to what is going on in Turkey, uh, relations with the EU, and what are the consequences of the Balkans. Because, for us, uh, uh, here, uh, especially after uh, the famous, or some would say notorious, Mr. Ahmed Avotoglu speech on the uh, 60th of October in 2009 in Sarajevo, which many of the people see as a, some kind of, let me say, sign or open, uh, well, uh, announcement of the huge return of the Turkey to the Balkans. Uh, and, but we don't have time to analyze, and unfortunately I will be focused here on just presenting the uh, uh, hypothesis or the thesis, we don't have time to explain more if we do have some time maybe for the discussion afterwards. So just excuse me for being such a brief and maybe sometimes maybe even more provocative than I would like to without the explanation. So actually what we uh, saw first uh, uh, as a very important uh, uh, point was of course this speech which is very interesting for uh, an analysis and uh, because Mr. Davutoglu is not only you know, a person who happens to be at the moment uh, Minister of Foreign uh, Affairs of Turkey, but he is a very uh, well-known scientist who has been worked very, uh, for a very long time on uh, his ideas of foreign politics and his famous book, which unfortunately is not translated yet neither to English, and we are translating that slowly to Serbian uh, uh, strategic debt or strategic which was published 
in 2000 is really a huge substantial program of new foreign policy of the Turkey, which is very much, I cannot say uh, totally against the Kemalism, but very much trying to reform that and to introduce some new elements. So actually, uh, when he, he was uh, advisor to the Prime Minister and uh, somewhere in this time, 2008-2009, finally he came to the position of the Minister of Foreign Affairs and started, uh, let me say, more strongly to insist on uh, this kind of new foreign politics. Well, but before that, we of course, Serbia, as you know, had a very uh, important uh, experience with return of the Turkey in one way in 99, which we are very keen to forget. Uh, Turkey has a very strong military power, uh, we do not have to forget that uh, maybe economically, as, as my friend uh, Inan said, it's having radical economic problems probably in the future. Uh, uh, strategically and uh, military speaking, it is the second most important factor within the NATO. The second strongest army after the uh, army of the United States of America, and they took very active part in the military operations of NATO, and as we know, very brutal bombing of nations out of Serbia, including cluster bombs. So for us, it was, you know, just very uh, a brutal return of the Turkey military to the Balkan center almost 100 years ago, and symbolically, very interesting thing. Uh, well, uh, so the whole this uh, uh, bunch of the issues uh, opened the issue which is very present in this region in the last at least five years uh, about the return so-called of the Turkey to the Balkans with a question mark. We can speak quite a lot upon that. So uh, all this uh, should be seen within the global context and this is the aim of the Turkey to become a regional and then a global power and uh, as you know there is a goal uh, officially proclaimed and up to uh, 2023, when there will be 100 years of the Republic, uh, Turkey should be top 10 economics. Now it is the 16th or 17th in the world. So, uh, what we had in Turkey in the last 10 years, what are the results of our uh, analysis? First, definitely, with all these uh, problems which are about to be seen, but the facts are showing that the great, we saw great economic reconstruction of Turkey under the AKP. First, they tripled GDP in the last 10 years, which is really something for the respect. There were plenty of very huge foreign investment. And uh, after all, we saw flourishing of tourism as a new and very developing uh, 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 branch of the industry with a huge uh, investments in the hotel and so on and so on. And uh, uh, as a result of that, we saw the raising of new middle class, especially in Anatolia region, uh, strengthening the educational system, and uh, which, on the other hand, has become more and more, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, hard to afford for many people. But you know, they, they uh, invest very much, uh, even in the private sector. And we saw new entrepreneurship layer, uh, which is also having maybe in the long term some kind of uh, social and uh, uh, other uh, consequences. Then, uh, generally speaking, we saw one new confidence and strength that has arose uh, the need to project this new uh, sense of the power uh, itself beyond uh, its borders. And this is. Uh, very direct consequences for the turn in the uh, 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 Turkish uh, foreign policy, which we'll speak to, uh, in detail a bit later. Then we saw signif significant investments in soft power, which is also something completely new for the Turkey, and economical investments in strategically important regions. Then, of course, something which we are all very familiar with, Sultan the Great, uh, uh, telenovelas, uh, has become very important segments of this overall enterprise, which is often called uh, with you know huge uh, debates about that if we can use that. But some people here speak about neo-Ottomanism or neo-Osmanism as a general approach of ATP or let me say structure, which you can see in architecture in this new interest uh, for the history of uh, great century, as this telenovela is called, and so on and so on. And, of course, what uh, uh, is definitely very true, and there are plenty of cases, we saw return of the Islam in public, social, and political life, generally. Uh, great, great importance is played by Jemats, and in particular of Hizmet, uh, of the, the famous Fethullah Gulen. Uh, we have one uh, 
uh, detail analysis of the Golan, which is a very, very important factor and very interesting, uh, uh, especially for the future development uh, in the Turkey. So, uh, as I said, the Turkish foreign policy during the last 15 years started definitely to leave the Kemalist Foundation and to return to historically significant regions. I would always call it this strategic and historical depth, very interesting uh, uh, definitions and ideas. Priority were, was uh, put to three regions, uh, Caucasian, Turkey, like we said, Turkey and post-Soviet space, then the Middle East and the Balkans as the third region. Uh, what, what is a uh, general goal, as it was proclaimed like uh, seven or ten years ago, is called zero conflict policy uh, with increased Islamic factor. So, uh, Turkey is a very strong country, a very strong power, but actually, somewhere in the 90s, there was a very strong sense that Turkey is isolated, that it is surrounded with so many potential enemies for different parts, uh, uh, for, for the different reasons. So actually, uh, what they did in the last 10 years was the idea to uh, start to uh, you know, uh, improve uh, relations, especially with the people around. You know. Of course, it has this uh, 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 kind of uh, economic hegemonic uh, uh, background, as uh, uh, Ruma was, uh, my friend Ruma was speaking. But on the other hand, you know, many people understood that actually it's weird to have better relationship with the United States of America than with the people in its neighborhood. And so, uh, uh, of course, when we got this Islamic factor that was connected to rising AKP power with the uh, general uh, going on in the region, we saw some things that were definitely un unimaginable like 10 or 15 years ago, especially in the Kemalist times. Well, support for Hezbollah, support for Hamas, reapproachment with Egypt, uh, reconciliation with Syria. I have to uh, uh, remind you that actually just before the conflict in Syria became, uh, uh, there were almost something like the bodies that the uh, family of uh, uh, Sadat was uh, coming to uh, spend together vacations and uh, to be at the seaside with Evan's family and so on. And some Chloe relations with the Iran definitely seen as the, uh, the biggest competitor for the regional uh, hegemony, especially among the Islamic uh, world. With all of this, we also saw deterioration of the relations with Israel and the United States somewhere around 2010, which was also seen as an additional amplifier of legitimacy among the Muslim countries. And that was, let me say, the high times of the, this regional politics and uh, of uh, uh, projecting of the power of the AKP and uh, Erdogan. Then we had very extremely contradictory relations with the United States. Uh, we had the earlier full cooperation <laughs> since uh, 1946 and uh, uh, Truman's doctrine up to Iraq case in 2003. We don't have time to explain, but actually uh, Americans, especially their, uh, 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 let me say, military and uh, political elite, was shocked actually when the uh, uh, Tur Turkish parliament refused to give uh, the license to the uh, uh, air forces of the United States of America to pass through their territory and to uh, implement attacks toward uh, Assad in the Iraq. Then we had a series of very hot issues somewhere around 2010, famous Mali Manbaris incident, then the uh, new Senate resolutions on the so-called Armenian genocide, and especially WikiLeaks dispatches, uh, which were uh, showing that, on the other hand, we have this, you know, hypocritical, good, uh, shaking hands between the political elites, but on the other hand, it showed up that uh, American staff there at the field uh, in Ankara was very unsatisfied and in some way, let me say, frightened by this new, as they call it, also new Islamic revival, and so on and so on. And uh, what came after that? Under the U.S. guidance, we may say that Turkey has entered into, into conflict with all of its neighbors, when you take a look nowadays, and that actually the whole, this zero problem policy has totally collapsed. So what we have? We have huge conflict with al-Maliki in Iraq, then steering in Egypt on the side of the Muslim Brotherhood, which led to disastrous relations with the new regime of al-Sisi. I have to remind you that actually a uh, Turkish uh, uh, ambassador was expelled, and so on and so on. Uh, then direct interventionism into Syria, which ended, as you know, with defeat and which really uh, had, I think, very disastrous consequences in the long term for uh, Erdogan himself, and worsening with Iran over Syria, etc., etc. Then we have very poor results in the post-Soviet space, where the Russians 
uh, regained, especially in the 2000 initiative, and where Turkey has failed to establish itself as a clean player, which was very strong strategic goal um, uh, in 90s and in 2000s. Um, let me proceed. So, uh, just briefly about the EU as a part of all this general agenda. EU de facto has for long not been a priority of Turkish foreign policy, and uh, uh, Romania was just speaking about that. Uh, although Turkish officials themselves do not speak of that for obvious strategic reasons. For example, moreover, they use that for internal purposes, such as the strengthening of civilian control over the military and the suppression of the traditional role of military in Kemalist Turkey. So say, they say, of course, this is what the EU is asking for us. You know? Well, we have to impose control over military, and actually in Turkey, as we know, it has absolutely radically different consequences that, for example, the EU would expect. Then, uh, 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 officially, how, how do we see this relationship? Just briefly to remind you, we have contract of the accession since 1963, then we have agreement to customs union in 1995, and official candidatorship since 1999. It's almost, how much? It's 15 years. And we have beginning of negotiations, official negotiations, in 2005. So, uh, up till now, it was in different times open, and uh, you know, uh, postponed, and then again open. Something around 50 chapters. Only one was closed in 2006. It's about the science and technology, as far as I remember. De facto, when you take a look realistically, United States and the Britain are encouraging and uh, pushing entry of the Turkey into EU. For example, Obama in his first mandate, the, the first visit that he made was of course to the European Union, and then after that he went to Ankara to uh, express his support for the Turkey and its uh, strong advancement to the EU. And on the other hand, especially Germans and the French are stopping and offering so-called privileged partnership, which uh, uh, elite of Turkey is seeing as something which is disgraceful, and so on and so on. So what are the real reasons why we have this stalemate in the different relations and accession? First, it's religious element, although it's not politically correct to speak like that. You know, when you speak with the guys from CDU in Germany, well, they will say, well, they are Muslim country and we don't want 70 million Muslims in EU because it's, well, Christian kind of perceived as a Christian uh, a project in some way. And, of course, they will not say that publicly, but generally we know that it's one of the most important reasons. Then you have the fear of different effects on the labor market. You see, you know, like tens of millions people from Anatolia coming and getting a job all around. And you know, French are very unhappy even to see the Polish coming to uh, uh, their Latvia, so not to speak Romanians and Bulgarians and so on. So then you have strong demographic imbalance, fear of the consequences for the common foreign and security policy. I remind you, it's the second strongest force in NATO that will probably go much more closer to uh, United States and Europe is not really happy about that. Then the issue of integration of Turks in Germany, uh, with, on the other hand, announcement of the so-called end of multiculturalism in 2010 and bilateral relation be between Germany and uh, 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 Turkey are is getting more and more interesting in all this uh, context. So, then we have returned to the Balkans, just briefly. There are the four hypotheses, why is it coming and what's the reason in the say, background of the whole thing. First, you have uh, perception that it is some kind of compensation for the poor performances on the post-Soviet space. Well, we didn't manage there, so okay, let's try to the Balkans as some kind of the region where we could maybe do better. Then, some people say that it is some kind of conscious indulgence by the Americans and the British to Turkey as an adequate pattern of the Balkan Muslims rather than some other less recommendable Islamic countries, for example, Iran or Malaysia or something like that. Uh, three, that it is independent initiative due to the special importance of the Balkans for the whole Ottoman tradition and this new Osmanism as some kind of, let me say, very important uh, 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 factor for the Balkan should be very important strategically and historically. Then, uh, even you can find sometimes hypothesis that Germany is keen to let the southern part of the Balkans to the Turkey as a, some kind of compensation for staying out of the EU. I'm just putting the hypothesis for thinking about that. I'm slowly uh, coming to the end. So, Turkey in the last seven or eight years has made definitely significant entry to the Balkans. 
some people would say that it is more like announcement, that it is more like promises and so, but there are, there are the facts and the real presence of the field. So, we have economic investment in Bulgaria, more than 5 billion of euros, Romania, 6 billion of dollars, they are mostly Herzegovina, Albania, Macedonia, Montenegro, recently, for example, especially in the banking industry, uh, uh, constructions, textile industry, and so. There is very interesting um, uh, involvement of the Turk in the Turkish companies in the infrastructure, highways, um, and especially airports. When you take a look about from Skopje, Okrit, Pristina, Berane, Lajic in Serbia, you see actually that Turkish companies are somehow uh, entering this. But on the other hand, people who are, you know, like interested in geopolitics, they see that they, it is just in one street region that is strategically very important and going, you know, to the Muslim parts, connected somehow, uh, well, they say they, uh, Turkish didn't invest really in Belgrade or, I don't know, in Zagreb and so on, but in these very strategically interesting regions. <coughs> then on the uh, Dianet, as you know, it's very important uh, 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 structure and organization in the, um, uh, uh, for the uh, uh, faith issues and communities in uh, uh, Turkey has spread the influence through the Islamic religious communities all over the Balkans with a strict effort to put them under its own control. In Serbia we have huge open issue due to this involvement of the Yani. Then TICA, Turkish Agency for the Reconstruction, has the projects in all of the Balkan countries and even Google Network of schools and universities is very, very present in Albania, in Montenegro, in Macedonia, even in Belgrade, they opened recently uh, the school. And of course, television shows and telenovelas, and this is just a brief overview of uh, Turkey's coming to the uh, Balkans. And let me just finish with a couple of these, this is the last um, uh, part of the presentation, so about the possible future and the possible problems. First, we have Turkey's own problems. I'm just going on where uh, Romania started. Uh, this impressive growth, and it is impressive growth, you know, how do you will see anybody having tripled their GDP in 10 years, was built on so-called hot money with a high rate of indebtedness. Uh, Roma had just explained this, you know. And the problem is that this money, which easily can, could very easily go out and leave the damaged economy. Then you have American support to Hizmet, uh, which the day before was used uh, to suppress Kemalism together with ATP, and now is slowly entering something which unfortunately looked like open quasi civil war between the Hizmet and the ATP. Uh, then you have Kurdish, uh, Kurdish factor as uh, susceptible all the time, unfortunately, for destabilization, and problems of the future constitution, which is by itself very, very interesting issue. Then the second, uh, we have poor and vulnerable foreign policy position, as we see. Uh, uncertain foreign policy orientations, tensions with Russia, with China, with Israel, with the United States, possible, and so on and so on. Thirdly, we have nominal focus on the EU. Nobody in Turkey will say that they are out of the uh, EU, well, in the future should be to EU. But on the other hand, you see the factual flirting with many other players and even with so called Shanghai Cooperation Organization and so on. And finally, at the Balkans, you have definitely distrust of the Balkan Christians because of one-sided actions supporting most Muslims, investing mostly in the Muslim-inhabited uh, parts, which neither minimally does not inspire confidence. And uh, finally, let me see, for us, very interesting focus of Turkey on Macedonia. Uh, especially military connections are very interesting and so on, uh, which is even in strategic depth you have uh, uh, some parts in which Mr. Otoglu is explaining why Macedonia is important somewhere in between Serbia, Bulgaria and Greece. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Misha. Now we will turn the floor to our expert on China, Mr. Anastas Vangeli. Thank you. First, uh, congratulations Serbian for the 10th birthday again. I was part of this organization for two years and it's been a pleasure and thanks for having me as a guest. Uh, yeah. All right, um, so I'm gonna focus mostly on China-Balkans relations. I'm gonna first talk a bit briefly about China's domestic and uh, foreign orientations. Uh, of course, I wouldn't talk a lot because it's an endless topic. I know there's a lot of interest. Uh, we can continue in the debate as well. I'm going to briefly talk also about China-EU relations due to their uh, complexity, so just keep it simple. 
In short, then, of course, uh, the, the main point will be what's happening in the Balkans. Um, so China in brief, as a global actor and as a, as a rising force, uh, in the West usually there are two opinions. One is this uh, fatalistic China will rule the world. Uh, it all started uh, with uh, noticing the rise of China in the mid-90s and uh, the continuing boom in the new century, and especially due to the fact that uh, China, unlike the West, remained uh, relatively unharmed from the global financial crisis. And there is this book by Martin Jacques, an airport bestseller called uh, When China Rules the World, which envisions a completely new modernity, new vision of the future in which China is uh, the central actor. Um, the, other, uh, the other version is China will collapse. There is a group of uh, writers, uh, most of them American, that uh, have written uh, even several versions of the book books with titles, uh, this year China will collapse, when they publish it next year, this is why China didn't collapse last year, it collapsed this year. But China has been going on for 25 years. Um, these days especially, it's really difficult to talk about China without referring to an important moment in history, 25 years ago, in the square. Uh, of course, uh, Stage Convention, this is the year of uh, anniversaries, this is one anniversary that remains, at least in China, uh, formally silent, but with a lot of uh, coercion on the sites to uh, prevent eventual uh, return to uh, of popular descent. Anyway, uh, I think it's very important for the previous discussions to note that uh, in 1989 we had 15 communist states, or states in which uh, there was de facto rules of, of uh, uh, communist parties <coughs> or formal opposition. Out of those 15, 10 democratized, but five remained the same. Uh, at least nominally, uh, and they're still pretty much alive and kicking today. Uh, and here, adopt the resilience and survival paradigm. I know in this country, this is just a brief uh, reference to uh, also my usual word. Uh, China, Vietnam, Laos would be put in the group of resilient uh, communisms, in which uh, which are characterized not only by mere surviving, but also by thriving and securing. Uh, popular consent and uh, having a uh, pretty positive foreseeable future and North Korea and Cuba are just uh, survival cases. I think this is also important for what, uh, what was mentioned uh, about how uh, what happened in 89 didn't necessarily lead to democratization, especially if you compare China to the former USSR. I mean, uh, you see that there is not much difference in substance. Aside from the Baltic states, we have authoritarian regimes probably even more authoritarian in China, I mean, in, although nominally democratic in Russia, and especially in the Central Asian countries, especially in Kazakhstan. So that was just brief. Uh, just put it contextual in China also, trying to relativize this, I think, very, very uh, ideologically Fukuyamist perception of China as a totalitarian giant and whatnot. How China has managed to become a resilient uh, regime uh, of course, at the core is the uh, uh, magnificent economic growth uh, in double digits for decades. Uh, beyond that, there are certain uh, policies and, and, and discourse, I call them legitimating strategies. Uh, of course, nationalism is important and, and not uh, contained institutional change. Uh, in that sense, authors have uh, suggested, for instance, calling the turn of 89 uh, instead calling it third wave of democratization, fourth wave of regime change, that is also to distinguish from the previous pre-communist transitions, but also just to point out that not always the outcome was democracy, but in addition to that, I would just say it was probably a wave of political change, because certain countries did change politically, but it did not change in terms of regimes, it did not change in terms of uh, who governs them. Uh, in terms of foreign policy, uh, I guess the uh, objective uh, <coughs> name for China was the regional power with global outreach. This is primarily because uh, of the own uh, perception of the Chinese. You know, whenever you say to them, oh yeah, you are uh, going to be dominant, you're a rising country, and all that, they would say, oh no, thank you, we're a developing country, we still have starving population, we, we don't really aim uh, to go that far. Um, uh, China, Europe, uh, I believe, um, Many of you know China and the EU are strategic partners since 2003. They have very substantial economic uh, relationship. They trade more than a billion 
uh, lower today. Um, the relationship was uh, strengthened in 2013 on the 10th anniversary by announcing the EU-China agenda, uh, which contains a four pillars, strategic cooperation, which is debatable how true to reality it is. Uh, second, uh, uh, trade uh, facilitation. The third, cooperation with climate change and environment, which is very important to both sides. And the fourth is people-to-people uh, -people exchange. Um, to analyze the EU-China uh, relations here is the concept of co-evolution. I'm going through a volume in which uh, we analyzed uh, China-European uh, relations uh, as driven by domestic imperatives. Uh, where actors enhance cooperation in, in areas of common interest uh, and they try